Section 11 of Weird Tales presents Asylum Atrocities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dan Grzynski. Weird Tales presents Asylum Atrocities. Nerve by Charles Frederick Stansbury. Prelude de Maupassant tells us, inimitably, of an officer who was afraid to fight a duel, to avoid which he killed himself before the hour for the conflict arrived. Doubtless you have never heard of a certain warden of the tomb's prison, who had his nerve with him all the time. He died not long ago. There was a prisoner in the tombs under indictment for an atrocious crime. He was tagged and thumbprinted bad, and bad he was. Why his hatred for the warden, I know not. But he had sworn by the eternal God to kill him, if chance paved the way, and doubtless he meant it. The warden sat in his office. He touched a button and sent for the barber. He had the barber lay razors and other tools for shaving on the desk. Then he dismissed him. The warden touched another button and sent for the bad man. The man was brought in handcuffed. He looked as though he had just broken loose from hell. "'Take off the bracelets and leave us,' said the warden to the keeper who had brought the thug in. The warden and the man who had sworn to kill him were the sole occupants of the room. The former went to the door and locked it on the inside. He handed the key to the convict, who took it somewhat sheepishly. The warden took an automatic pistol from his pocket, and placed it on the desk near the razors. He then removed his coat, waistcoat, collar, and tie, while the prisoner eyed him with dazed intenseness. The warden sank easily into his desk chair, leaned back his head, placed his feet upon the edge of the desk. He appeared to be quite at ease. The grim ghost of a smile traced itself in the small wrinkles about his mouth. "'Shave me!' he ordered. It was called a sanatorium, such appellation being de rigueur, sanitarium, sufficing for the needs of the proletariat. It was set in the midst of a glade as beautiful as any spot in nature. A purling brook meandered through groves of silver maples, aspen, and oak, fringed with orchards deep laden with glowing, luscious fruit. In front of the building there stretched an extensive group of firs, beech, and oak, the ground carpeted with pine needles and murmuring golden leaves. Bright birds peopled the grove. Some of them sang sweetly, and others talked confidentially. At least they talked to the gentleman with the wet brain, whose barred window looked out up on the pleasant wood. The gentleman with the wet brain was locked in room number seven. To analyze or explain a wet brain would tax the ability of a greater alienist than any now extent. The delicate laminated gelatinous membranes enveloping the brain and cushioning it against the walls of the skull become highly inflamed. They assume an individuality of their own and talk to the brain proper. They tell tremendously interesting lies, keeping the patient awake as they tell them. The brain proper believes these lies, whereupon gentlemen, eclept alienists, say that the patient is suffering from delusions. There are delusions of grandeur, which make the patient happy, and delusions of persecution, which make him melancholy or suicidal. Now what do the alienists do to this creature with the inflamed brain? Soothe him, of course. They soothe him by injecting crotalin into his veins. Crotalin is the venom of the rattlesnake, Crotalus horridus. It turns the blood to water, and when it fails to kill, it evokes loathsome sores. So much for the alienists and the gentleman with the wet brain. Locked in a room without books or a light at night, left alone with his delusions, congestion, inflammation, and rattlesnake poison combined, tended to make him unruly at times. The hell of indignation broke loose within him. To stay the paroxysms of these tempests of the brain, they had him beaten. No easy process when dealing with a brain on fire with envenomed blood. A word about Challey. 
in addition to serving as a tenant or orderly in the sanitarium he acted as chauffeur of a car the name or make of which suggested the nickname of chally his real name i trust is over his grave wherever that may be but i doubt it chally possessed an indefinable quality of lovableness of which possession he was totally unaware a bright-faced boy with an engaging smile in which there could be traced a tinge of melancholy doubtless the result of sensibility of temperament chally sometimes brought number seven his breakfast or saw to his bath a strong feeling of attachment grew up between the normal lad and the morbid patient chally would have cheerily committed crime to assuage the agony written on the wan face of the elder man but he could not encompass the impossible or neutralize the irony of fate the wet-brained one had been manhandled before but chally had not been commandeered for the bout the chastisement had been administered by two husky young assistants one a tough lad of the stuff of which gunmen are made the other a dreamy young giant when normal but an accomplished devil when under the influence of heroin to which drug he was an addict night had fallen on the glade bringing insufferable depression of soul to the patients there environed the bird voices were hushed and the little brook murmured to itself in the darkness possibly in protest at man's inhumanity to man the locked-in one had developed a meticulously abnormal acuteness of hearing an effort of the ears to do duty for the eyes groans stertorous breathing and hysterical laughter reverberated through the corridors and then the eager listener heard the vehement whisper protest of chally who had been ordered to assist in the punishment of unruly number seven chally implored said he had never done such a thing didn't know how yet even in his misery he was too astute to claim fondness for the man who was listening behind the door his protests were in vain he was peremptorily ordered to join the other lads and do the job why he did not run away at this juncture will never be known perhaps he too was a prisoner by night the wet brain was prepared for the worst but determined to put up a fight he pressed his ear to the crack of the door listening intently when he was convinced that the two other lads had left chally alone in the corridor thank you chally he called through the door the boy must have heard but doubtless could not trust himself to reply an hour passed in which the silence was as dense as the darkness then a sound as of muffled sobbing then running water in the bathroom but a few feet away a stifled groan as the bathroom door closed they found chally's body in that room he had filled the bath and held his head under the water until he was stone dead they found him so for hours that seemed eons the imprisoned man continued to listen in the darkness he felt that he was in the toils of mystery insoluble then he heard furtive whispering in the passage he heard the soft sad sad of felt slippers a soundless noise like that made by black trackers in the dark australian forest he heard anxious murmuring and the swish and plash of water in the bathroom they were washing the body more hours passed in the presence of tragedy number seven had evidently been overlooked or forgotten the silence was broken now only by the stertorous breathing of a sufferer the wet brain was getting wetter the man crept to the window and tore his hands in a wild effort to wrench the steel bars apart suddenly a brilliant light flashed through the trees in the grove fronting the house as the twin acetylene reflectors of a motor hearse illumined the dark aisles as it wound its silent way through the roadless wood and stopped in front of the house of hopelessness the position of the stars told the watcher that it was between two and three o'clock a sound of chanting soft and low the doors opened and a radiant light flooded the roadway in front of the main entrance of the building the hearse reflected it with ghastly brilliancy by pressing his face against the bars and straining his eyes in a sidelong glance the tortured soul in number seven could see clearly all that occurred 
two sisters in wide-winged white coronets came forth and stood on the porch in an attitude of prayer they were followed by two men alert and businesslike who bore between them a metal box that looked like a steamer trunk they clicked it into place sideways at the rear end of the hideously up-to-date vehicle the sisters retired and the closed doors left a black void pierced only by the bright eyes of the death wagon which retraced its noiseless way like a guilty thing throwing a ghastly light upon the tree stems until its diminishing glimmer faded into infinite darkness with an icy sinking of the heart the overstrained observer of this horrible function fell to the floor there they found him next day Chally was seen no more of men. End of section 11